ladies and gentlemen, I think that is the show time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar, the title of Constitutional Values. On behalf of the organized organizers of this event, that is uh, the Faculty of Law and Political Science of the Pazmine Peter Catholic University, the Central European Association for Comparative Law, uh, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, the Mishkwad's Regional Committee, and uh, at last but not least, the Ferenc Model Institute of Comparative Law. Uh, the reason uh, why we uh, had organized this event is the 10th anniversary of the Hungarian uh, constitution, uh, that is the, fund the so-called fundamental uh, law. Uh, one of the main features uh, of uh, this uh, uh, constitution, uh, the great amount of the characteristic values. That was the reason uh, why uh, we have invited uh, renowned scholars uh, from this region uh, to publish, to provide uh, their thoughts uh, about uh, the values uh, of their constitution. And that was the reason why we have provided uh, an opportunity in our journal, uh, that is the Central European Journal of Comparative Law, uh, to provide the uh, to share uh, their ideas. We are very lucky uh, that uh, at this moment uh, we can present uh, the digital version of this journal. Uh, you can see it in the chat box, uh, the uh, web link of the journal. And therefore, uh, this event uh, provided by these uh, scholars, by uh, by the authors uh, of this uh, uh, of these articles, is to uh, present a short summary uh, of their uh, publications. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, that this event, this uh, uh, webinar, is also part uh, of the so-called uh, Future of Europe. Uh, this is a series launched by the European institutions uh, to, uh, to for the uh, uh, stakeholders, you know, uh, to share their thoughts uh, about the potential future of the EU. This uh, event, therefore, is part of this series, and of course, you have an opportunity at the end uh, of this webinar to ask uh, the uh, experts of this webinar, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Now I would like to call uh, our partner from uh, Pazman Peter Catholic University, Professor Balash Shonda. Uh, professor, the screen is yours. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, am I right that we are kind of ahead ahead of time, uh, thanks to your uh, very modest uh, in, uh, the, the, the introduction? You have saved uh, a couple of uh, minutes. I. Uh, it shouldn't mean in, uh, that uh, that I would be talking uh, significantly longer as uh, as foreseen. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I could join uh, this event. Um, in a way or another, uh, we got used to uh, we got used to this this kind of uh, webinars and uh, uh, events, um, but. Uh, all of us prefer, I believe, uh, personal uh, personal meetings, uh, despite uh, the effectivity of uh, of this type of uh, scientific uh, exchange. Uh, I think the best uh, cartoon of uh, of all ages uh, is uh, is a Hungarian one. Uh, it is called Cat City. Um, Cat City is a uh, is a uh, well. Uh, I I'm I don't want to be a spoiler, uh, and uh, I couldn't give you a a, a trailer of it. Um, it's a fantastic. Uh, it is a fantastic uh, uh, cartoon uh, uh, movie, um, and uh, the superhero 
in, uh, in this uh, story, uh, at a certain moment says that I don't believe in technical gadgets. Uh, uh, the, the superhero we school, the Grabowski, uh, uh, it's uh, an apocalyptic fight between mice and cat um, uh, with a fantastic uh, outcome at the end. Uh, Grabowski says that uh, I don't believe in technical gadgets. Uh, uh, I will, I will, um, we will always have, always have friends. Uh, friends are more important than technical gadgets. And um, I, I just um, prefer uh, talking to people face to face uh, instead of uh, instead of uh, making uh, fancy presentations uh, on uh, uh, with, with Prezi and PowerPoint and uh, and all kinds of that stuff. Um, it brings much more uh, when when uh, we can truly share. Uh, ideas. Well, uh, the fundamental law of Hungary, uh, we often uh, refer to it as uh, as the basic law. The, the prevailing uh, title has become a fundamental law, but uh, maybe both, uh, uh, both titles could be uh, correct uh, in, a, in a sense. Um, the fundamental law is characterized uh, by, a, by a language. Uh, that has a religious that has religious uh, connotations. Um, the very first sentence of the fundamental law of Hungary um, is uh, is in fact uh, still uh, before uh, put there before the preamble. Uh, the preamble also received a a, a name a title uh, that may need a may need some uh, explanation, but this very first sentence uh, needs an uh, explanation uh, to, uh, to marry many foreigners. On the other side, on the other hand, it's absolutely evident for all Hungarians. It is, um, it is the first sentence of the national anthem of Hungary, uh, the national anthem, a poem from 1823, uh, often it's often sung in ch at churches, and at churches it's clearly a player, a prayer. Maybe in a football stadium uh, it doesn't really sound as a prayer, but uh, uh, it's uniting all Hungarians in a way that it is not excluding uh, anyone, irrespective of uh, individual religion or a belief or the lack of religion and belief. Um, it is a, it is a, it has a general message. And in this way, the constitution maker was able to put the name of God to the first place uh, in, a, in a way uh, smuggling God into the constitution um, without uh, uh, truly referring uh, uh, explicitly to God as a, as a, a person uh, described by a certain theology or a certain religion. It is uh, embodied, this God, uh, in, uh, as a motto of the Constitution, is embodied uh, into, a cultural net, into a cultural net. And uh, it, it goes clearly, uh, refer, it's a clear reference, uh, a quotation without quotation marks uh, from the National Anthem. In the preamble, we have uh, two references uh, to Christianity, to the Christian legacy, both of them are, uh, are uh, uh, referring uh, to the history, to our national past. Uh, one is referring uh, to St. Stephen, our first king, the St. founding king, uh, who has made Hungary part of Christian Europe a thousand years ago. And the other is a recognition of the historical ro uh, role of Christianity uh, in preserving the nationhood. Uh, in, a, in a sense, it is a, a reference that is a, a bit maybe utilitarian. It's not recognizing the role of Christianity. It is not recognizing the role of Christianity as a religion. It is recognizing the role of Christianity in the history of Hungary, in preserving nationhood.
And uh, in this sense, it is not a prescriptive, but a descriptive uh, uh, sentence uh, stating a historic uh, fact. Um, when we go to the text, uh, that in the text in Article 4, uh, that has been a later addition to the text of the, of the fundamental law. Uh, in Article 4, uh, paragraph uh, or uh, subsection, uh, Article R, uh, subsection uh, 4, uh, we have an interpretative uh, uh, sentence on the Constitution, uh, making it uh, the duty of all uh, state organs to protect uh, the constitutional identity and uh, the Christian culture of Hungary. Um, it is um, an interesting uh, in uh, uh, challenge of interpretation what this sentence means. It is, uh, is it a, a sign or a Zola kind of category? It is uh, protecting, defending the liberty to, to wear miniskirts or it's a provision against miniskirts. Um, in uh, my understanding, it is uh, uh, it is not a uh, it's again not a, a provision that is uh, prescribing uh, or making a, a kind of a culture a certain certain culture uh, to a general constitutional ru rule. Uh, much more. It is uh, there to defend, to protect uh, the given culture that is a fruit of Christianity, of a history determined by Christianity. And uh, it is not uh, an infringement of the freedom of, uh, of anyone. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, part of Christian culture is the freedom to revolt against the Christian religion. It is uh, if, uh, our culture uh, is strong enough uh, to to uh, to uh, to tolerate uh, even more uh, to embrace the freedom of all others. Uh, also, those not sharing uh, the same uh, legacy. An interesting formula is another addition to the. Uh, uh, to the fundamental law, to the text of the fundamental law, and that is a, this is about uh, education, uh, because at, uh, education has become uh, the upbringing of the next generation has become a very sensitive issue, uh, and uh, at uh, at uh, this uh, uh, section, Article 16, uh, subsection uh, one, uh, we have a reference. Uh, to Christian culture again, and a value system based on this Christian culture. Uh, it's not Christian religion or Christian faith as such, but a culture stemming from Christianity. Uh, this should be the underlining uh, cultural concept beyond uh, education. In a sense, it is, uh, it is something similar what we have in some German constitutions, the Bavarian, for example, the Bavarian Constitution makes it a provision that uh, the Christian education uh, and uh, including uh, uh, the respect for God uh, should be the, uh, the, the, uh, the common education uh, system uh, germ uh, Bavarian education is based on. Um, it is, uh, it's not about religion, it is again about, but it's more than about culture, it is about a value system. Well, you can say that all this, uh, the motto, the preamble, references on a kind of a culture belong to the, belong to the wrapping, uh, belong to the language. But what about the content? When we go to the content, then uh, I think we can recognize that in a, at a, mem at, at, at a set of uh, very sensitive issues, uh, the, the content of the fundamental law uh, is truly rooted and, uh, in Christianity and connected with Christianity. One example uh, could be uh, the, uh, the endorsement of a traditional, the traditional concept of marriage, a bond between a man and a, and a woman. Uh, this should be marriage. 
uh, the fundamental law even has a provision uh, um, determining that uh, the mother should be a woman and the father shall be a man. Uh, it is uh, maybe, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, a natural law inspired uh, provision, uh, simply recognizing uh, a natural fact. Uh, and this shouldn't be overwritten by, uh, by state legislation. The person, the human person, is very much in the center of the, of the language and the content of the fundamental law. Again, beginning with the preamble, uh, uh, already the preamble has a reference to human dignity. And uh, then uh, in Article 2, uh, we have a, a clear message on uh, on human dignity recognized uh, by uh, by the fundamental law. Um, it's an interesting sentence because it is combining two different co concepts of dignity. Um, the first sentence of Article Two uh, is in a way endorsing the inherent concept of human dignity. A natural law concept again, uh, recognizing human dignity as such. In the second sentence, it's a longer sentence, um, the right to human dignity is recognized. If the first sentence would be maintained only, there should, we should have had a right to, of human the, the right uh, to have your human dignity respected and not a right to dignity. Uh, but here we have a, uh, a clear statement on the right to life and dignity. And then the second part of the sentence is uh, prescribing uh, a protection of unborn life. Uh, the, the, right, the life of the fetus shall be subject of protection. This does not mean uh, an, an individual protection, uh, but a state duty uh, to protect uh, uh, unborn life. Uh, person, marriage, wife. Uh, these are very essential uh, concepts uh, uh, underlined by religious communities, especially uh, by, uh, by the Christian church in various denominations. Uh, another fundamental message uh, uh, the Christian legacy would underline would be solidarity. In the national law, in the preamble, we have a reference uh, to to, uh, a, to a moral duty, uh, and uh, it's almost a religious language what we have here in the preamble: a duty to help the vulnerable and the, and the poor. It is a moral duty, but we also have it, uh, this uh, uh, duty in a much more uh, uh, concrete way. Uh, with regard to the family, uh, we have in the in the fundamental law a provision uh, prescribing uh, the the duty uh, of intergenerational uh, solidarity. Uh, not only the duty of parents uh, to raise their children, but also the duty of kids, of grown-up uh, children, to care about their parents. Uh, the one. Uh, uh, the one uh, uh, core element of Christian social doctrine that uh, I wouldn't really find in the fundamental law, or not in, a, in an explicit way, is subsidiarity. Uh, the fundamental law is not endorsing the concept of subsidiarity uh, as elaborated by the Christian social doctrine. Um, uh, I don't have time now to go into detail in, in this. Well, uh, to sum up, in, uh, the, the, the fundamental law is clearly rooted, uh, is clearly endorsing uh, Christian values and uh, Christian language and Christian cultural tradition is endorsed by the fundamental law. And it is also, you can see from the very first sentence to the very last one, uh, we have uh, messages, uh, language. Uh, is uh, is, is uh, carrying messages uh, of uh, of this uh, 
tradition. But what the Constitution, what the state can protect with regard to Christianity is, a, is in a way just the culture or just the values stemming from Christianity. In a way or another, these are the fruits of a tree. Christianity being the roots. And uh, the state, the Constitution, is, uh, is by nature uh, not uh, able and not adequate to protect the roots or to keep them alive. If, they, if these roots uh, dry out, if they die, sooner or later, maybe in a generation or two, uh, this tree will not bring fruits anymore. We talk a lot uh, and we have a, a, a huge uh, social change. We ha have been having a huge uh, social change over the last decades regarding uh, the social role of religious communities. Uh, first of all, of the mainstream uh, Christian denominations of the country. Uh, huge social expectations have been there that they should be more active in providing social services, not just uh, uh, faith, not just religion, uh, not just uh, services, but social services, education, healthcare, caring about uh, the elderly, the sick, etc. This is very important and it's a very essential. But maybe even it's more essential for the community as such that someone should, uh, uh, should bear responsibility uh, for the roots our culture is stemming from. Certain people have a, have a better sense of, for music or they have a talent for dancing, or they have a talent for, uh, uh, for arts or whatever. People having more talents uh, in, in fields like that have a responsibility in maintaining that part of the culture uh, and uh, keeping that, that culture alive and revitalize that kind of culture. People who are believing, uh, people who have faith, have a responsibility, not just for their souls, uh, but also for the community as such, uh, to keep this tree alive. And not just for their own sake, but for the sake of the, of the whole community. And this is, I believe, this goes much more beyond the, the text of the fundamental law, the text of the constitution. Um, it's a, uh, I'm afraid my, my, my time is up. Uh, I'm glad uh, to see a few faces and, uh, and to join, uh, uh, join you this, uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, and the, the Lou faculty of, of Pazman Peter Catholic University is, is, uh, is glad to, co to be a co-organizer uh, of, uh, of this event and to take, take part in, a, in, in the project. And I also very much appreciate that uh, the volume, uh, the journal has just been published. I've just received also the, the, uh, the message that, uh, that it, is, it is online. Uh, our colleagues at Model Institute do a, do a great job. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful for, uh, for that. And uh, I think that in, uh, that in these maybe, uh, we can say, dramatic days, uh, we live in our region. Uh, friendships are uh, are so important, uh, and personal contacts and human faces. Even if uh, at the given event we couldn't meet in person, but I had the privilege of meeting many of you in person uh, uh, over the last year, and I hope that these uh, contacts can be kept alive, uh, like the tree I was talking about. Thank you for your kind attention. Professor, thank you so much for this kind of introduction and presentation of uh, about your uh, article. Uh, of course, it's worth noticing that uh, uh, Professor Shanda is uh, uh, one of the greatest experts uh, here in Hungary about uh, this issue. That was my reason why I would like to comment uh, it after his uh, pre presentation. You know, <laughs> uh, he cannot contradict <laughs> you know, uh, 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 this uh, assessment. Uh, 
Uh, dear colleagues, uh, now I would like to uh, call uh, Professor uh, Jukic, uh, Dalibor Jukic uh, from University of Belgrade Faculty of Law uh, to uh, deliver his presentation uh, about uh, uh, Serbian and Greece uh, Christian values. Uh, Professor Jukic, uh, are you here? Uh, yes, I am. I uh, hope that you can see me. Uh, I think it works properly. Yes, yeah. okay. Everything uh, is okay, and thank you so much. The screen is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you, dear Professor Silaji. Uh, um, I will try now to share my presentation with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, uh, it is uh, a really special honor and pleasure to participate in today's conference. Uh, Firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to the Ferenc Magli uh, Institute of Comparative Law for the invitation to particip participate in this uh, webinar, this conference, and to congratulate Professor uh, Silaj and his team uh, for the excellent organization of this uh, important uh, scientific, scientific event. Uh, as you can see, my paper uh, contains an analysis of uh, two constitutions the constitution of uh, the Republic of Serbia and the constitution of Greece. Um, the constitution of the Republic of Serbia was adopted in 2006. The main reasons for its uh, adoption include the democratic changes in 2000 and the change of the Serbian statehood the, as Serbia became a sovereign state uh, in the same year. Another reason uh, the constitution was adopted was the, that the constitution makers wished to point out uh, that the territory of Kosovo and Metohia was an integral part of the territory of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, the Greek constitution was also a post-revolution constitution from 1975. Uh, the seven-year dictatorship of the colonels ended in 1974. Uh, the new constitution established a presidential parliamentary democracy uh, although the constitution was adopted uh, with a relative major majority of votes, it gained broad uh, support over time from the political forces in Greece. Uh, now, uh, I will uh, tell a few words about uh, the preamble, preambles of those constitutions. It was stated in the preamble of the Greek constitution, you can see uh, on the presentation, that it was adopted in the name of the holy and consubstantial and indivisible trinity. Uh, although the doctrine of the holy trinity is fundamentally common to all Christians, uh, the Greek constitution makers identify it with only the orthodox denomination. This is evident from the provisions of article 59 of the constitution, which proposes a different text for the oath to be taken by deputies not of the orthodox denomination. Uh, the fact that the Supreme Legal Act in Greece was adopted in the name of the Holy Trinity is indicative of the close relations between the Greek state and Christianity, uh, despite the lack of the consent in the relevant literature concerning whether, whether the preamble uh, has any legal effect. Uh, the preamble of the Serbian constitution is somewhat longer and seemingly free from any religious dimensions. It is pointed out in the preamble that the promise of Kosovo is a part of the territory of the Republic of Serbia and that certain constitutional obligations of all state authorities arise from such a position of the province, of that province. Despite the initial impression that the preamble does not include any religious elements, it should be stressed here that Kosovo, along, 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 with, uh, along with other territory, uh, along with its territorial dimension, have ex exceptionally important spiritual dimension for the Serbian people, as it is a territory that is a symbol of Serbia's Christian roots and uh, traditions. Uh, uh, now, about the constitutional model of relationship between the state and church, uh, there is a big difference between uh, uh, Serbia and Greece. In, the, uh, in Article 3 of the Greek uh, Constitution, uh, you can see that uh, it stipulates that the Eastern Orthodox Church of Christ has the st uh, status of the prevailing religion in Greece. Uh, many theoretic theoretical works have been dedicated to the implied meaning of the term prevailing religion. 
uh, when the different attitudes are taken into account, it can be concluded that there are at least four different theoretical approaches. The opinion that by the term prevailing religion, the constitution maker implies the religion of the vast majority of the population of Greece predominates the more recent literature. Uh, there is the argument opposing this opinion that contend that the constitution does not include statistical data on the population of Greece. Nevertheless, the prevailing religion enjoys special care and protection by the state and it has a unique legal position. The Serbian constitution makers choose the system of uh, dissociation or separation of the state and church. The constitution of the Republic of Serbia stipulates in articles 11 and 44 that churches and religious communities are separate from the state. Debates in Serbian literature have revolved about the type of dissociation or uh, the type of uh, separation of the state and church and churches and religious communities. Uh, on one side uh, are the authors who maintain that the constitution introduced a system of strict separation of the state and church, and on the on other side are those uh, who uh, believe that the type of separation of the state and religion is not determined by the constitution and that the system of cooperative separation has already been rooted in the Serbian legislation. This dilemma was resolved by the Constitutional Court, uh, which explicitly concluded in two judgments that the system of cooper cooperative separation uh, of the church and state was being applied in Serbia. Uh, now, uh, uh, some uh, Christian, uh, Christian, uh, Christianity and Christian uh, values in the Constitution of uh, Greece uh, was, of course, uh, one of the main topics of this article. Uh, the constitution of Greece comprises a series of provisions that protect uh, the Christian values and the reputation of uh, Christian churches and all other religious organizations. Uh, article 3 of the constitution of Greece that I have already mentioned includes a regulation governing the protection of the text of the Holy Scripture, of the Holy Bible. The Holy Scripture has, of course, exceptional importance for Christian spirituality and identity uh, as of Christians as the source of Christian doctrine. Uh, the Constitution also guarantees freedom of press, of the press, and prescribes limitations of such freedom as well. One of the, limitation, uh, of, of the limitations is established in Article 14, uh, Section 3, which stipulates that the press can be uh, cartilated uh, uh, following a publication in case of an offense against the Christian or any other known religion. Concerning education, the Greek constitution makers prescribe that it's uh, objective is, among other things, the development of nation, national and religious consciousness. Since the vast majority of the population is of orthodox religion, it is clear that the development of religious consciousness must be to some extent related to Christ Christianity, while the rights of uh, members of other uh, religions and uh, religious movements are not reduced. Uh, Ownership right of some specific uh, property types, such as mines, caves, archaeological sites, lakes, abandoned spaces, etc., is regulated by Article 18 of the Constitution, as is the ban on expropriation of agricultural land that is under the, the ownership of free monasteries, under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, as well as any property of so-called Eastern Patriarchates, those are Patriarchates of Alexandria, Antiochia and Jerusalem, and the Holy Monastery of Mount Sinai in Egypt. Uh, thus, special care has been demonstrated for the property of the Orthodox churches, the seats of which are not located in the territory of Greece. Uh, the Constitution also prescribes the text of the oath to be taken by the president of the republic and the deputies in the greek parliament in both cases the oath is taken in the name of the holy trinity 
the constitution of Greece envisages that uh, heterodox uh, deputies may, ad uh, may adjust the oath to their religions or beliefs. Such an option, however, has not been envisaged in the case of the oath of, to be taken by the president of the republic. It could be claimed that the constitution makers preferred an orthodox Christian as the president of the republic. And finally, uh, Article 105 of the Constitution of Greece also relates to Christianity. In itself, this article is a small constitution, um, uh, constitution in constitution. In, uh, it comprises, uh, comprises uh, a series of provisions regulating a position of Mount Athos. It is a small peninsula in northern Greece uh, with a small monastic community there. Um, and which is according to the constitution, a self-governing territory of the Greek state. The constitution recognizes the existing uh, legal regime and uh, relinquishes the governance of Mount Athos to monastic institutions. Few tasks, however, as protecting security and public order and exercising uh, judi judicial powers remain under the purview of the Greek uh, states, of the Greek state. Uh, now, Christian values in the constitution uh, of the Republic of Serbia, uh, the, the Serbian constitution does not include uh, a substantial number of provisions that could be directly linked to Christian va uh, values. This is a consequence of the current Serbian constitution originating from the tradition of socialist constitutionality. Uh, the term church has been used in uh, 2006 Serbian constitution in, in a positive sense, unlike the case with the 1946 Yugoslav constitution, wherein it has been used only uh, or dominantly in a negative way. Uh, although constitutional provisions pertain equally to churches and religious communities, the term religious community was used in Yugoslav constitutions to refer to religious organizations in general. Uh, however, in the 2006 uh, Serbian constitution, the term religious communities was replaced by churches and religious communities to ensure that the special significance of Christian churches was indeed recognized since the church is a special form of a religious society that is uh, characteristic of the Christianity as a religion. Uh, the 2006 uh, constitution has no provisions uh, comprising any religious elements. Uh, an exception to this could be the Article 7, which uh, regulates the state coat of arms, flag and anthem. Uh, the constitution prescribes that the state anthem is Bože Prade, the God of Justice, which begins by addressing God. Uh, this is the only instance in which God is mentioned in the text of the constitution. Uh, the fact that the state anthem includes an invocation of God is indicative of the close connection of the state and national identity to religion. In addition to the above mentioned, it should be pointed out that other state symbols have a religious basis, uh, such as the two-headed eagle and the cross with four fire strikers. And the first article of the constitution prescribes that the Republic of Serbia is a state based on affiliation to European principles and values. European values, uh, without any doubt, uh, include values with religious or, or, uh, origins. This is also confirmed by the, by the Treaty of Lisbon. Its preamble mentions the universal values inspired, among, among other things, by European religious heritage. Uh, so the Constitution has thus implicitly prescribed that the Republic of Serbia is based on religious values as well, on the condition that they represent general European values. Uh, values. The Constitution of the Republic of Serbia guarantees equal equality of women and men, which is a Christian value that has gained the universal significance in modern times. Uh, according to Christian, Christian teachings, the human beings is one being in two forms, the male and female one. Despite the frequent objections to Christian Christianity due to women's position in certain Christian churches, the actual contribution of Christianity to the improvement of the position of women in the past is often disregarded. Uh, suffice to, it, uh, uh, to mention that it is the only religion that preached preach that woman was the crown of the creation of the world, 
Uh, as early as in the second half of the second century, Justin the Martyr developed the concept of the gender equality of men and women in his works, which was a completely novelty for the age uh, in which he lived. Uh, the Constitution of the Republic of Serbia prescribes universal equality of people before the Constitution and the, and the, the law. Equality, equality of all people according to their nature is also one of the values discussed by the great Christian teachers, such as Gregory of Nisa and others. In addition, in the majority of Christian churches, the ideas of equality and equity are included in their documents on the concept of human rights. Uh, the Serbian constitution recognizes only the marriage that is concluded before a state authority based on the free will of man and woman. Uh, hence, uh, the constitution makers excluded the possibility of recognizing the validity of marriage concluded according to the rules of religious organizations. Uh, thus, the position of religious person was made more complicated since they have, uh, they were forced to have two weddings uh, if they wished their marriage to be recognize, recognized by the state. On the other side, the constitution makers made the uh, introdu introduction of the same sex marriage impossible. Uh, marriage uh, is as a lifetime union of two persons of different sexes, also defined in the regulations of the Serbian uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, thus, the constitution is protecting marriage in the form in which that institution was developed in Christianity and uh, in accordance with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, values of uh, Christian ch uh, churches. Um, for the conclusion, uh, uh, I think that my time is uh, up. Uh, I would like just to, to point out that discussions about the contemporary constitutional nature of secular states rare, rarely consider the contribution of religion and religious organizations to the development of the fundamental constitutional principles. Despite the close connections between the constitutional tradition of the majority of the European countries and religion, the prevailing perspective in most cases is that, is that the con, con, contemporary constitutions and their principles are the result of the French Revolution, liberalism and secularism. Uh, this perspective disregards the fact that all the above mentioned movements origin, originated from the Christian milieu and in societies wherein the Christian churches played a dominant role. Although the French Revolution was characterized by an anti-clerical attitude, one cannot claim that all its consequences and all the accomplishments of that event preserved such character. Therefore, therefore it would be beneficial to consider the extent to which modern constitutions are based on, on Christian values, as well as whether certain values of anti-clerical anti movement are actually values that have been promoted by Christianity for centuries in uh, European societies, uh, European societies, and are still being promoted by uh, Christian churches. In the end, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would be grateful to hear your thoughts and questions during the discussion. Professor, thank you so much for your contribution. And uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, another member of the uh, Central European Professors Network, that is Professor Franesh Tanisic uh, from the University of Zagreb. Uh, uh, professor, uh, I would like to uh, share the screen with you, of course, and please uh, share your thoughts with us uh, about the constitution of Croatia and Slovenia. Professor, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Silagi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity and congrats congratulations on the timing on the publishing of the uh, journal. So it is very nice that our papers are published on the same day as this webinar. Uh, just wait that I share my presentation with you. I hope you can see my presentation. Yes, it's okay. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much. So uh, my task is to present Christian values in the constitutions of two states, uh, Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, they are very similar yet very different. And uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, give a theoretical introduction. So when we talk about the use of Christian values in constitutional texts, uh, this question does not provoke much debate. 
Some states include explicit invocations of God, some do not. Some use explicit Christian values, some use implicit Christian values, but we don't debate uh, so much about the, the uh, use of the, such uh, values in constitutions. However, there was a fierce debate uh, when the making of the, uh, while making the failed European constitution, because uh, there was a fierce debate with, uh, on that, whether the uh, Christian rules of Europe should or should not be included in it. Uh, finally, they were not included, but this created an opportunity to discuss this topic and the incidence of Christian values in various constitutions. So uh, we should say to, uh, or I would like to present two theses. First, notwithstanding the fact whether a constitution contains a special invocatio dei or mention of a specific religion, all constitutions contain certain Christian values as they are universal. And uh, as a response to those who, who claim that secularism does not uh, allow for Christian values in the constitution, even when constitutions include invocatio dei, not only uh, implicit or explicit Christian values, it is not possible to reach state neutrality in such a manner. I will show later why. When we look at the uh, constitutions of Western states, we will find several uh, examples of use of Christian values. We saw that especially the Greek, Greek constitution has a very strong uh, invoca invocatio dei and Christian values, but it is uh, the, the true for constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany which begins with a preamble stating conscious of the responsibility before God and man. Federal president takes an oath and the oath ends with so help me God and so on. A very uh, interesting uh, example is the constitution of the Republic of Ireland, which starts with a preamble that is perhaps the most vivid incantations of Christian values. It starts in the name of the most holy trinity for whom is all authority and to whom as our final end all actions both of men and states must be referred. Constitution of Poland, of course, has a preamble that proclaims we, the Polish nation, all citizens of the Republic, both those who believe in God and so on. Hungarian constitution, as we already heard, has numerous invocations of God, recognition of the role of Christianity in nationhood. Maltese constitution prescribes the Roman Catholic apostolic religion as a state religion, obligatory Catholic religious education. There are provisions defining marriage as the union of man and the woman in Poland, Hungary and Croatia. So, one must ask the question, is introduction of Christian values and or God in constitutional texts good or bad thing? So we must, ourselves, we must ask ourselves the following question. What is the function of, of, of a constitution? Every constitution has a minimum of three functions, constituting the state, institutions of government, division of power, and limiting state power to safeguard citizens. However, there are two very separate views. One can argue that the constitution is also to be regarded as a kind of a deposit that conserves and reflects the values, ideals, and symbols shared in a particular society. So it is a mirror of a society for which it has been created. On the other hand, one can also argue that the secular state must be neutral and that it should not support nor impinge on any religion, and that is the reason including Christian values in the constitution would represent a breach of state neutrality. However, there are states that have included Christian values and or God in their constitutions, and there are those that are strictly considered strictly secular, I would rather say secularized, and that at the first glance do not include any Christian values and or God in their constitutions. However, as I already stated, there is no constitution in the world, or in the Western world at least, that does not have Christian values inherently embedded in it. Namely, what is equality in front of law if not a Christian value? That all men are equal and created in the image of God. The principle of equality under law is best grounded in a holistic view of human dignity, as in the compendium of the social teachings of the Catholic Church. Recognizing God in a constitution does not necessarily impose a religious character, belief, or practice detrimental to non-religious citizens. Rather, recognition alludes to the shared heritage, which is very important, and tradition, and acknowledges that religious individuals and groups are legitimately part of the modern democratic state and interact with it. 
when we take into account the famous Lao Tzu versus Italy judgment, in which the court said a display of an indisputably Christian symbol, which is present every day to all pupils and teachers on the wall, the cross, and it does not have an effect of proselytism. How could such a conclusion be derived from the use of the word God in constitutions? When especially no one reads the constitution every day, if ever. So when we took, take this thesis into account, now let's see the Christian values in the Constitution of the Republic of Croatia and Slovenia. It must be uh, reiterated that the, both constitutions, uh, especially Croatia, uh, entered into force in 1990. And Croatia was then still a part of communist Yugoslavia. So we have to take that into account when we uh, search for Christian values in this constitution. It does not contain any provisions in which God or any particular faith is mentioned. However, there are many provisions that are important for the freedom of religion and the understanding of the Croatian state church model. The constitution, when we talk about the uh, state church model, the constitution truly and completely stipulates the separation of the state and church in part Article 41, Paragraph 1. However, in Article 41, Paragraph 2, the Constitution also stipulates the obligation of the state to assist and protect religious communities in their activities. So we must say that in the Republic of Croatia, a cooperative or concordant model of church-state relations is in force. If we consider the provisions of Croatian constitutional explicit invocations of God, Provisions establish the state religion or special provisions that would explicitly, explicitly endorse certain Christian values are not included. However, there are many provisions that mirror certain Christian values. Some parts of the constitution are undoubtedly Christian in origin, although it is not explicitly written down. It. So equality in front of the law, protection of life and so on. But for example, in the preamble, when discussing the historic origins of Croatian statehood, the independent medieval state of Croatia established in the 9th century has been mentioned. This is very important because it shows the link with uh, the Christian heritage. Because the independence of the medieval Croatian state is heavily linked with the papal recognition of Croatia, when Pope, pope John, John VIII and Comes Branimir exchanged letters and the Pope addressed Branimir as Dux or Comes Coratorum in 1879 and blessed him and the nation land. This letter was considered among Croatian historians as the first international recognition of Croatia. Therefore, the mention of the independent medieval state is strongly linked with Christianity and papacy as Branimir became the Pope's vassal. The second example of clear depiction of Christian values is Article 61, Paragraph 2, which defines marriage as a living union between a woman and a man. This provision was added to the constitution after the success of a referendum of, people, of a people's initiative in 2014. The people's initiative was obviously motivated by Christian values and it was held in December 2013. It was in reality the first successful national referendum in Croatia after the referendum for independence in 1990. It was initiated by a citizen initiative in the name of the family. It argued that the traditional values of Croatian society must be protected by enshrining the traditional heteronormal definition of a family. It was held on 1st December 2013. Around 38% of eligible voters voted, and the State Election Commission announced that 65 of those voted yes, and 33% voted no. So the uh, definition of marriage was introduced into the Constitution. One must uh, especially mention the provision of Article 47, which allows for conscientious objection of those who are not ready to participate in military duties in the armed forces because of their, their religious or moral views. There are some doubts regarding the reach of uh, provision of Article 47, but mostly uh, we agree that it, that it can be construed that this provision protects other conscientious objections, not only military ones, for example, in medical procedures, which is very important regarding the concessions of action about abortion. Uh, the confirmation of such claims can be found in the legislature allowing for a conscientious objection in medicine, dental medicine, and so on. When we take account Slovenia, uh, we must see that following the country's secession from federal Yugoslavia as Croatia in 1991, their constitution stipulated the freedom of religion and the continued separation of church and state. From uh, 
1991 to 2007, we must say that the church-state relation in Slovenia was one of strict separation. But after 2007 and the enactment of the Religious Freedom Act, we must uh, really see that uh, their state-church relations model is one of cooperation in reality. So unlike the Croatian constitution, the Slovenian constitution does not contain any provisions that are clearly linked with Christian values. There is no mention of the past Christian times, no definition of marriage and so on. This is the consequence of a rather unique approach to state-church relations adopted in Slovenia in 1991, which mirrored France's laicite. The only indirect mention of God is through the national anthem in which God is mentioned. It is called Zdravlica, and it is a poem by the famous Slovene poet Franz Perchere. However, only one, of the, one part of the poem has been used for the national anthem, and that part does not contain the mention of God. However, like in the Croatian constitution, there are numerous provisions that can be linked with Christian universal values and the social teachings of the Catholic Church. Slovenia is defined as a state governed by rule of law. It is a social state. The constitution guarantees equality before the law and safeguards human life. One should also highlight the compendiums in the social teachings of the Catholic Church, prohibition of third torture and link it to the constitutional ban of torture. Like the Croatian and Hungarian constitution, the Slovenian constitution especially protects family, motherhood, fatherhood, children, and young people, and bans incitement to national, racial, religious, or other discrimination. One provision should, all, should be, uh, be especially highlighted as it clearly depicts, depicts a Christian value. This is Article 46, which must be linked to Article 173, which states, Koshesu's objection shall be permissible in cases provided by law where, there is the, where this does not limit the rights and freedom of others. So unlike the Croatian constitution, the Slovene constitution protects the right to conscientious objection more broadly. This is somewhat surprising, considering the different constitutional setups of the two states. It is obvious that this provision does not only include conscientious objection regarding military service, because this is prescribed by Article 173. This means that the scope of Article 46 is broader and that it encompasses the right to abortion as well, meaning that the Constitution allows for such an objection regarding uh, the procedure of abortion. This is a clear Christian value provision because of which the Freedom of Religion Act of 2007 prescribes that the exercise of religious freedom includes the right to refuse the fulfillment of obligations set by law that are in grave conflict with the religious conviction of a person. This right may be limited only by statute or by law if this is needed for the protection of other constitutionally protected values and if such limitation is able to pass a strict test of proportionality. So, to conclude, Christian values embedded in constitutional texts are no rarity in the Western world. However, the constitutions that clearly invoke Christian values are a minority. All constitutions have certain Christian values embedded in them especially when comparing the social teachings of the Catholic Church and the constitutional provisions of different constitutions. One can clearly see that they align. This is, of course, the result of the fact that many Christian values are universal. The Catholic Church promotes equality of men. This is depicted in constitutions as equality in front of the law. Additionally, the Church promotes the protection of an individual's human rights, prohibits torture, pleads for the protection of family, and so on. All these aspects can be found in almost every constitution. Croatia and Slovenia are two very similar, yet very different states. Both states were a part of the same state in the period from 1527 to 1991, where a part of, were a part of the communist world and emerged as independent states in 1991. Croatia opted for a very close relations with religious communities, especially the Catholic Church. Slovenia opted for a very strict state neutrality model that was often compared with the French model. However, the explicit mention of Christian values in the constitutions of both states is little or almost absent. Of course, both, both constitutions contain numerous provisions that can be linked with Christian values, especially the social teachings of the Catholic Church. Therefore, the conclusion can be drawn that Croatia and Slovenia have very similar constitutions regarding the use of Christian values although they follow very different constitutionally arranged models of state-church relations. Thank you for your attention 
and I hope that I did not pass my allotted time. Professor, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and contribution uh, uh, concerning the Croatian and Slovenian uh, uh, constitutional provisions. Uh, now, uh, we would like uh, to uh, <coughs> to uh, uh, link uh, a video uh, of uh, Professor Attila Varga. He is an associate professor uh, at the Sapientia uh, Hungarian University of Transylvania, that is in Romania. And uh, via uh, his uh, video, uh, he is going to uh, provide us uh, an assessment of the uh, Romanian uh, constitution as to the values. Mindenek előtt szeretném megköszönni a meghívást és a lehetőséget, hogy részt vehetek ezen a konferencián, és egyszer mint szeretném megköszönni mindazoknak, akik lehetővé tették, hogy a témakörben néhány gondolatot megosszak önökkel. Előadásomban a keresztény értékek jelenlétét a román alkotmányban, és ezzel szerves összefüggésben a család, illetve a házasság alkotmányjogi védelmét mutatnám be, utalva az alkotmánybíróság vonatkozó eset gyakorlatára is. Mondandóm, abból az előfeltételből, hipotézisből indul ki, miszerint általában a jogszabályok, de különösen az egyes országok alkotmányai nem értéksemlegesek, hanem éppen ellenkezőleg jól meghatározható, esetenként ételesen is megfogalmazott értéktartalommal rendelkeznek. Ezek részben kifejezetten jogi értékek, de alkotmány esetében jelentős politikai, gazdasági, szociális és morális értéktartalomról is beszélhetünk. Ezen értékek különösen az erkölcsi, de bizonyos esetekben akár a politikai jogi értékek is a keresztény gondolkodás, felfogás, tanítás által meghatározottak. A keresztény vallási és nem vallási értékek, Szerves részei egyéni gondolkodásunknak, kultúránknak, társadalmaink közfelfogásának, nyugati és európai, beleértve különösen közép-kelet vagy éppen kelet-európai civilizációnknak. Bár kétségtelen, hogy a kereszténység vallási dimenziója, a vallásos gyakorlatra vonatkozó része erőteljesen meggyengült, de még a nyugat-európai közösségek, társadalmak, egyének esetében is ezek tudatalattiában, nyelvi fordulataiban jelen van a keresztény szellemiség és kultúra lenyomata. A kelet vagy éppen kelet-európai társadalmak esetében pedig éppenséggel tudatosan vállalt létező jelenség a keresztény értékek, különösen a különböző egyházakhoz való tartozás kifejezése, vagy éppen a keresztény hit megvallása. A keresztény értékrend életfelfogás évezedes örökségünk, amit éppen napjainkban a leghevesebben igyekeznek egyesek elutasítani, megtagadni, vagy éppen gúny nevetség tárgyává tenni, mindez pedig a félreértelmezett és abszolútnak vélt szólásszabadság nevében. Ez a magatartás azonban méltatlan ahhoz a szellemi kulturális múlthoz, amelyre még nem is olyan régen méltán, hogy büszkék voltunk. Előadáson első felében a román alkotmány keresztény szellemiségű értéktartalmáról szólnék, majd második részében a házasság és a család keresztény felfogású alkotmányjogi és polgári jogi szabályozásáról. A román társadalom jelentős többsége magát keleti ortodox vallásúnak vallja, és, nem ortodox, és a nem ortodox lakosság is valamilyen más, úgy mint római katolikus, protestáns felekezetűnek mondja magát, ami azt jelenti, hogy románia népességének több mint 90%-a vállaltan keresztény vallású, bár kétségtelen, hogy ez az elmúlt években ö, csökkenő tendenciát mutat. Tehát a társadalomra vonatkozó ezen tény, ténynek, körülménynek, állapotnak az ország alaptörvényében, alkotmányában is meg kell nyilvánulnia. 
A szenti adatok ellenére is a román alkotmány keresztény szellemiségű érté tartalma nem kizárólag az ortodox felfogásból, annak tanításaiból vagy szellemiségéből származik, hanem biztosan állítható, hogy éppenséggel a nyugati kereszténység a római katolikus és a protestáns szellemi hagyományokra felfogása épül, ennek értékrendje érvényesül számos alkotmányos rendelkezésben vagy jogelben. Ez pedig azért fontos, mert az alkotmányozó döntésén, választásán, értékopcióján érték alapult, vagyis éppen a nyugati értékközösséghez való tartozás tudatos vállalása, ami ezen értéklet iránti meggyőződésen alapuló elkötelezettséget fejez ki. A keresztény eredetű fogantatású morális, jogi, politikai értéktartalom legközvetlenebbül bizonyos alkotmányi rendelkezésekben fogalmazódik meg. Három alaptörvényi szintű területet említek, bár részleteiben csak az elsőt fogom kifejteni. Ez a három a következő. Az alkotmány általános rendelkezései legfőbb értékként rögzítik többek között az emberi méltóságot, a személyiség szabad fejlődését és az igazságosságot. A második az alapjogi rendszer, az alapjogi katalógus esetében kimutatható, jól kimutatható keresztény erkölcsi értéktartalom, és a harmadik pedig bizonyos államszervezeti elvekben felfedezhető keresztény értékrendhez köthető felfogás. A legfőbb alkotmányos értékekként megjelölt emberi méltóság, igazságosság, személyiség szabad fejlődése a zsidó keresztény vallások elsősorban morális értékrendje által meghatározott, és mint ilyen az európai nyugati típusi civilizáció alapilléreinek tekinthető. Lehet ugyan próbálkozni azzal, hogy függetlenítsék, leválasszák, vagy éppen szembefordítsák ezeket az értékeket a keresztény vallással, annak legmélyebb lényegével, szellemiségével, de ez hosszabb távon reménytelen kísérlet lenne. Az ember méltósága az Isten képmására és hasonlatosságára történt teremtésben gyökerezik. Az emberi méltóságban kifejeződik az, hogy az ember lelkének, valamint értelmi, érzelmi és akarati cselekvési képességeinek köszönhetően szabadsággal felruházott lény, ami éppen az isteni képmás kiváltságos jele. Az emberi élet és emberi méltóság értéktani axiológiai megközelítésben abszolút értéknek, önértéknek, önmagáért való értéknek minősül, tehát olyan legfőbb érték, melyet alkotmányos jogállamban elsődlegesen az alaptörvényben kell rögzíteni. A román alkotmányban az emberi méltóság, mint legfőbb érték, és nem mint konkrét alapjog jelenik meg. Ugyanakkor az alkotmánybírósági értelmezésben az alkotmányos alapjogok az emberi méltóságon alapulnak. Tehát Tovább menve a találos testület kifejtette, hogy az emberi méltóság alkotmányos fogalmának nem pusztán deklaratív, hanem kifejezetten normatív értéke van. Meghatározott különálló tartalommal bíró alapjognak minősíthető, amely az ember, mely az ember minőségét határozza meg. Ebből pedig az következik, mondja az alkotmánybíróság, hogy az alapjogok bármilyen megsértése egyben az emberi méltóság megsértését is jelenti. Jól érzékelhető az alkotmánybírósági esetgyakorlat jogfejlesztő, alkotmányfejlesztő hatása. Következésképpen az emberi méltóság alapozza, az emberi méltóság alapozza meg az élethez való jogot, a halálbüntetés tilalmát, a családvédelmi, de még a tulajdonjogot, a szolidaritást, a társadalombiztosítási jogokat elegészen az egészséghez való jogokig. Az emberi személyiség szabad fejlődése vonatkozásában megállapítható, hogy minden bizonyal egyetlen olyan világvallás sincsen, amelyben az egyénnek, az individumnak olyan jelentős szerepe lenne, mint éppen a kereszténység. A keresztény tanítás az, amely harmonikus egyensúlyt igyekszik teremteni az ember, mint önálló lény, egyén, mint önálló személyiség, és mint közösségi társadalmi lény közötti viszonyban. 
A keresztény értékrend az, amely közben a közösségnek, az egyazon hiten lévő közösségének szerepét fontosan, fontosnak tartja, de nem hanyagolja el, mi több kiemeli az egyént, annak személyiségét, különösen a keresztényi szabad akarat, szabad döntés érvényesülésének biztosítása révén. Az igazságosság olyan alapértékként tételezhető jogi, erkölcsi, politikai, szociális elveket feltételez, mint az egyenlőség, a méltányosság, a szabadság, a tolerancia, közjó, közrend, tisztesség, szociális gondoskodás, társadalmi, közösségi szolidaritás. Ezen követelmény értékek keresztény tartalmát, keresztény szellemiségű értelmezését, magyarázatát, valamint keresztény eredetét nehezen lehetne megkérdőjelezni. A római katolikus egyház tanítása szerint a társadalomban élő ember életének minősége, az igazságosság és szeretet viszonyában fejezhető ki, amely a társadalom szövetét alkotja. Az Alkotmánybíróság egy 2021-es határozatában talán először fogalmazta meg konkrét eset kapcsán egy tanulságos és érdekes ügyben, utólagos normakontroll keretében az igazságossággal kapcsolatos álláspontját, mely egyben az emberi méltóságra is utalt. Egy személy ellen büntető eljárás indult korrupció gyanús ügyben, vádat emeltek ellene és első fokon elítélték, ami ellen ugyan fellebbezett az érintett személy, de a ráki szabott szabadságvesztéssel járó büntetés végrehajtását meg kellett kezdeni. Közel egy évet töltött börtönben, minek után a fellebíteli bíróság jogerős határozatában felmentette bűncselekmény hiányában. Ezek után a személy kártérítési keresetet nyújtott be a bíróságra, mivel ártatlanul ült börtönbe. A bíróság elutasította a kérelmét, azzal indokolva, hogy nem jogosult kártérítésre, mivel a hatóságok úgy a nyomozati, mint a bírósági eljárás, eljárásban törvényesen jártak el, nem sértettek jogszabályt. Az eljárás ezen fázusában került az ügy alkotmánybírósága, és a tanáros testület megállapította, hogy a büntető eljárási törvénykönyv valóban csak arra az esetre írja elő, elő a kártérítési jogosultságot, ha az eljáró hatóságok törvénytelenséget követtek el, ha azonban törvényesen jártak el, és utólag mégis ártatlannak bizonyult a személy, akkor az nem jogosult semmilyen kártérítésre. Az alkotmánybíróság szerint a törvény rendelkezései hiányosak, amiért a fenti esetet nem szabályozza. Az ügy azonban jelentős morális az állam felelősségével, az egyén méltóságával, szabadságával és összességében az igazságossággal összefüggő erkölcs és jogfilozófiai kérdéseket vetett fel. Ezekre az alkotmánybíróság többek között a következő válaszokat adta. Az állam létének rációja és finalitása az alkotmányban rögzített legfőbb értékeken közöttük az igazságosságon alapul. Az igazságosság nem csak az állam jó működését biztosítja, hanem a társadalom bizalmát is az állam intézkedései iránt, konkrétan pedig az igazságszolgáltatásban vetett bizalmát. Az igazságosság egy alkotmányos koncepció, amely, ha figyelembe vesszük erkölcsfilozófiai természetét, önmagában nem normativizálható, nem fogalmazható meg tételes jogszabályi rendelkezés, rendelkezésként, de ennek ellenére kerete és mércéje az állami cselekvésnek. A társadalom érthető módon igényli az igazságosságot, mondja az Alkotmánybíróság, az államnak hatóságai révén feladata ezt megkövetelni és érvényesíteni. Az igazságosság minden állami cselekvés belső elengedhetetlen része tartozik, amely, ki, amely kivetül az alapjókra és azok tiszteletben tartására. Előadósom második részében a házasság és a család keresztény felfogású alkotmányjogi és polgári jogi szabályozásáról szólnék. A család és az ezt megalapozó férfi és nő közötti házasság nem az állam szabályozó akaratának a kifejeződése, hanem elsődlegesen államon és jogon túli, illetve kívüli alapintézmény, 
amely az emberi közösségben formálódott a természetes együttélési normák, valamint a társadalmi rendeltetése szerint. Megtapasztalva a család csökkenő társadalmi szerepét, néhol pedig a tudatos szervezet és szisztematikus cselekvést a család eszményének és valóságának a lerombolására, már második János Pál a pápa is megfogalmazta annak szükségességét, hogy idézem, az államhatalom szembeszálljon azokkal a törekvésekkel, amelyek szétzillálják a társadalmat, és általának a polgárok méltóságának, biztonságának és jólétének továbbá törekedjenek arra, hogy a közvélemény ne kapjon olyan indítatásokat, amelyek következménye a házasság és a család intézmények, intézményének a lebecsülése. A család több puszta jogi társadalmi gaz, gazdasági alapegységnél, mondja az egyházfő, a szeretet és a szolidaritás közössége, amely egyedülálló módon alkalmas a társadalom és tagjai számára alapvető kulturális, erkölcsi, társadalmi, lelki, vallási értékek átadására és közvetítésére. A keresztény családfogalom az európai jogi kultúrában kizárólag a férfi és nő kapcsolatában megnyilvánuló emberi méltóság, isteni természeti rend, valamint a jogegyenlőség, a kölcsönös tisztelet és gondoskodás keresztényi felfogása alapján meghatározott jogelvek, jogi értékek szerint jelenik meg. A román alkotmányjogi és polgári jogi felfogásban a házasság és család jogi fogalmai külön kerülnek értelmezésre, de szervesen és elválaszthatatlanul összekapcsolódnak, valamint okokozati viszontban vannak. Az alkotmány a házasságot kizárólag két személy és a sajátos nyelvi megfogalmazás ellenére is, mely semleges házastársak fogalmat használja, egyértelműen is kizárólag férfi és nő közötti életközösségnek tekinti, és erkölcsi társadalmi jogi értékként védi. Mindebből az, az is következik, hogy a házasság és család jogi intézményének a védelme elsősorban alkotmány jogi kérdés, Különösen az alkotmányi szabályozások feladata, az erre vonatkozó alapelvek és célok megfogalmazása. Az teljes egyértelműséggel állítható, hogy a házasság és család román jogi szabályozásában, úgy alkotmányi és különösen polgári jogi szinten a hagyományos értelmezési, meggyőződéses keresztény felfogás és szemlélet érvényesül, ami összhangban van a társadalom, társadalom túlnyomó többségének a felfogásával. Az alkotmánybíróság egy határozatában, amit végül is egy sikertelen alkotmánymódosítás során fogadott el, és azt fogalmazta meg, hogy az eredeti házastársak közötti kifejezés megváltoztatása férfi és nő között kifejezésre lényegében csak pontosítás, pontosítása a házassághoz való alapjog gyakorlásának. Egyértelmű meghatározása annak, hogy ez kizárólag biológiailag két külön nemű ember között jöhet létre. Arra is rámutatott az Alkotmánybíróság, hogy az eredeti szövegre is a fenti értelmezés érvényes, mert az eredeti alkotmányozó egyértelmű szándéka 1991-ben is az volt, hogy a házasság tradicionális az emberi természen rendjén alapuló fogalmát használja, és számára biztosítsa jogi. Védelmet. A 2011-ben hatályba lépett új polgári törvénykönyv rendelkezései, rendelkezései nem hagynak kétséget a törvényhozónak a kérdéskörrel, illetve szóhasználattal kapcsolatos tradi- tradicionális keresztény ortodox álláspontjáról. Ez szerint a jelen polgári törvénykönyv értelmében házastársak alatt a házassági kötelékben élő férfi és nőt kell érteni. A továbbiakban pedig kategórikus és határozott egyértelmű, egyértelműséggel fogalmazza meg a polgári törvénykönyv, hogy a házasság egy férfi és egy nő szabad megegyezésén alapuló törvényes kötelék. A férfi és a nő a családalapítás céljából jogosul összeházasodni. Továbbá azt mondja még ki, hogy a házasság kötés egy férfi és egy nő között valósul meg azok szabad és személyes beleegyezésével. 
Az azonos neműek házasságával kapcsolatosan pedig a polgári törvénykönyv ugyancsak meglehetősen kategórikus szabályt fogalmaz meg. Azaz, tilos az azonos nemi személyek közötti házasság. Az azonos nemű román vagy külföldi állampolgárok között külföldön megkötött vagy szerződött házasságokat Romániában nem lehet elismerni. Az ellentétes vagy azonos nemű román vagy külföldi állampolgárok között külföldön megkötött vagy szerződéssel létrehozott illettársi kapcsolatokat Romániában nem lehet elismerni. Tehát sem a házassági, sem az élettársi kapcsolatokat, azonos neműek közötti kapcsolatokat nem ismeri el a román polgári törvényként. Mindezek a rendelkezések egy világos, morális álláspontot tükröznek, amelynek alapja a sidó keresztény vallásos esetünkben keleti keresztény ortodox meggyőződés, miszerint az Isten az ember férfinak és nőnek teremtette, természeti biológiai állapotuk, illetve társadalmi rendeltetésük, az, hogy családot alapítsanak, melynek jogi eszköze a házasság. A fentiek alapján igazolható, úgy vélem, hogy igazolható kezdeti hipotézisünk, az, hogy a keresztény értékrend hatása jelenléte jól kimutatható a román alkotmány egyes rendelkezéseiben, de ami ennél talán még fontosabb, hogy jelen van a társadalomban élő valóságként, amit sem az ország döntéshozóinak, de az európai nemzetek közössége, amit Európa Uniónak nevezünk, vezető tisztségviselőinek és különösen tisztviselőinek sem szabad figyelmen kívül hagyniuk. Köszönöm megtisztelő és türelmes figyelmüket. After the uh, video, pre video presentation uh, of Professor Attila Varga, I would like to provide the opportunity for uh, Dr. David Kostecki from the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin. Uh, Professor Kostecki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, make an explanation that I'm not uh, I'm not having not it's tie because it's uh, winter time and the winter holiday I'm during winter holiday therefore <laughs> my uh, look is a little bit um, casual than uh, than formal sorry uh, please you are you are very lucky <laughs> yes I, I am really lucky uh, to be with you it's it's a great honor it's a I'm glad it's a great honor to be here with uh, the Ferenc Institute uh, Medal uh, Institute. Of course, um, I have a presentation um, here uh, connected with my subject, with my subject, which uh, I hope so uh, some uh, facts were, weren't included so far. So uh, it will be uh, um, it will be a great um, opportunity, a great possibility to um, take everything into account and to add something because it's really vital during our intellectual feast um, to add something more than the professors and uh, um, and uh, different uh, perspectives uh, were um, considered. Uh, so um, we are waiting for uh, my presentation. It's PowerPoint live, but it's only uh, prepare. It's preparing. It's on. Probably you can see it uh, now. I hope yeah, so. It's, yeah, uh, it's acceptable. Absolutely. It's acceptable. Great. Perfect. So the subject is uh, axiology of the Constitution of the Republic of Poland of 2nd April 1997. Some only some reflections because my performance is um, uh, 15 minutes, so I, I can say some uh, general truths, general remarks, uh, which are really important. Um, of course, I would like to cordially thank for invitation to present my research. I am really uh, honored, uh, I, I, I said, to take part in such prestigious academic enterprise, uh, uh, um, uh, academic enterprise. And um, of course, um, um, the subject sounds axiology. Axiology, so we have to take into account some structure of my presentation because um, the passage of almost a quarter of a century since uh, since uh, since the adoption of the Polish basic law offers a valid excuse um, to to reify to to uh, to look into the matter uh, for the next uh, step about the constitutional axiology 
which is uh, increasingly increasingly becoming the subject of political dispute not only for lawyers practical lawyers theorists but uh, but generally speaking it's it's kind of political dispute about polish constitution it seems uh, that offers of the supreme law of the republic of poland were initially guided by by sl slightly different ideals uh, however uh, broad case has become a test of um, timelessness and timeliness of the, of this constitution um, from this perspective the question of uh, of grounds uh, for an amendment of the basic law is highly current uh, pertinent yeah uh, so um, therefore um, however we should um, find some more um, basic fundamental level question for example um, this question uh, is decoding the constitutional values, forming the uh, foundation of, of the Polish legal system. Uh, in, in, in light of this, these reflections, um, it, it's, it's fundamental level question. So have the values pursued by offers of the constitution uh, become real or have they just uh, become a redundant ornament in the legal erudition devoid of any practical value? So therefore, we can analyze um, some historical legislator and uh, and dynamic interpretation, current interpretation. So um, it's uh, it gives us um, a new perspective. I, I hope so. Uh, of course, I would like to compare common good and common will uh, in the tradition of Polish constitutionalism. It's uh, it's it's worth um, it's worth uh, looking into the matter. It's worth considering how we can define common good because it's connected with social science, Catholic social science and common will connected with communitarianism. And uh, and of course, uh, finally, grounds for an amendment of the basic law. It's necessary or, or not. Uh, fundamental dilemma, two opposite concepts. When we are talking about axiology, it's it's uh, it, we have we have uh, some questions, some natural questions. For example, the uh, logical transfer from sentences about facts, what is, to sentences about values and duties, uh, what should be. In his, um, uh, of course, it it was formulated by David Hume in his uh, treatise of human nature um, and uh, in literature we can say that it's uh, it, it's called uh, it is called uh, the naturalistic fallacy uh, by referring um, of course um, this two opposite concepts axiological cognitivism so evaluation standards and values have cognitive qualities um, it is possible to understand values generally speaking yeah so cognitivism ascribes logical value to moral judgments in my opinion according to the doctrine we can say that uh, polish constitution confess uh, confesses uh, axiological cognitivism axiological non-cognitivism this doctrine entails negation of objectively established values uh, according to a representative of this trend, uh, values are neither true nor false. One can't know values. Rulings and jurisprudence relating to Polish constitution demonstrate the existence of universal and common values. It, it was confirmed by a tribunal, a constitutional tribunal in Poland um, uh, many years ago. Uh, of course, uh, some uh, metaphorically speaking, when we when we are talking about law and morality, it's called in 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 philosophy of law, in legal philosophy, Cape Horn of the philosophy of, of legal philosophy, and it is possible to state firmly that axiological reflection is the Cape Horn of the state legal order because values are uh, are a transmitter are transmitter some. Um, ideology some um, assumptions yeah the only thing to be done is um, cite the words of a renowned theorist Matthias Melman renowned theorist of the law uh, one who wants to talk about law meaningfully cannot uh, remain silent about morality uh, this is particularly pertinent when it comes to values uh, in the law uh, that constitute an inherent inherent part of both uh, law and morality. In, in other words, it is not possible uh, to separate uh, the law from values. 
as the law is uh, the basic uh, uh, career in the political and social systems of all contemporary states, not only democratic ones, of course. Uh, mm, a little bit uh, historical point of view, mm, the Fed May Constitution. Uh, we've got here the uh, paintings of uh, famous Polish painter Jan Matejko. Um, uh, it's um, uh, it's um, uh, from uh, he, he, Jan Matejko depicted nodal events from Polish history, and uh, it's the Fed My Constitution, yeah. So he, he was the author of numerous portraits, uh, the most, uh, generally speaking, he was the most uh, gen uh, the most celebrated Polish painter, and the Fed May Constitution is said to be first one in Europe and the second one worldwide, following the Constitution of United States of America. And uh, um, after this statement, we should analyze the constitution, what um, the meaning constitution um, in the context of Latin language. So constitution, a system or an organization, so fundamental, constituere Latin, arrange or establish, concipere, express or renounce, constare to stand heavily or to be certain or known, and constance, a constant unchanging phenomenon. Of course, uh, we have looked into the ancient tradition because ancient tradition, um, it's not um, devoid um, of constitution. When we, uh, I would like to uh, recall the Cicero. Cicero uh, sa says that constitutio is a certain morphological structure and set of operational rules defining the organization and functioning of the state at uh, various levels of power, which comprise not only of legal standards, but also perhaps in particular time hundred customs. So uh, in um, in modern uh, times, it's not a constitution, but some uh, origins of the constitution we can find in ancient tradition. Uh, mm. Next, uh, next part, preambles, preambles, uh, when uh, axiology, of course, uh, the most thing which we look, which we are looking for uh, in values are preambles, preambles and the functions because um, preambles are found in legal acts uh, and the, the meaning of preamble is, is known. Particle, particular importance of, of the legal systems acts that are um, that, that preambles give uh, um, new um, prestigious um, meaning of uh, of uh, act, not only constitutional act, but agreement, uh, less frequently ordinary legislation. But uh, uh, in my practice, uh, I I I. I'm, I met with um, preambles in ordinary legislation. It is uh, a little bit more common than two or three or, or ten years ago. Uh, the preamble is a section wherein in the legislator indicates in particular that values legitimizing the legal order or, or, and the constitution itself. So we can decode many values from preamble. Uh, the preamble makes uh, it possible to decode the hierarchy of individual constitutional values and to determine the relations between individual and um, uh, values, uh, between individual values. Uh, this uh, fragment of, of uh, constitution, uh, Polish constitution preamble is, is, really, um, is really vital uh, to decode some uh, values. So um, sovereignty, sovereignty, uh, I I don't predict that I could speak in such international context conflict between uh, war between Ukraine and Russia between West and East yeah but sovereignty it's it's, it's value um, a really universal first sentence of Polish preamble having regard for the existence and future of our homeland which recovered in 1989, the possibility of a sovereign and democratic determ determination of its fate. Yeah, so so it was uh, really, uh, really vital. Uh, of course, some changes started a little bit earlier than 1997, but because the December amendment in 1999 uh, changing the first chapter of, of um, the Constitution of the People's Republic of Poland, but 
Unfortunately, the Soviet troops were stationed in Poland until 1993. So uh, reaching the sovereignty is kind of process like democratization. Yeah, so the name of the state was changed uh, to the Republic of Poland in 1989. But, but of course, the constitution from 1997 it was a proof of certain axiological ambivalence, but and gives grounds to uh, to our uh, to our uh, give grounds to our basic uh, law. Um, referral to the best uh, tradition of. Uh, on the one hand, we've got the referrals to the best tradition of the first and second republic of Poland. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we we are recalling the, the this best traditions yeah in in our preamble but of, on the other hand the bitter experience of times when basic human freedoms and rights were being violated in our homeland yeah but but this uh, why why i um, why i am explaining to why i am explaining to you this axiological ambivalence because it wasn't called by a legislator that uh, the um, uh, time after after the Second World War was really um, bad for Poland. Was really bad for Poland. It was it was said that bitter experience of times when basic human freedoms and rights were being violated in our homeland. It wasn't so um, un unambiguously said that it was time of uh, the third war. For, for many soldiers who, who are the last soldier who, who, who was fighting for Polish independence uh, was killed in 1963. So the war um, was lasting uh, during this time. And uh, despite the fact that the war was lasting, the legislator decided the bitter experience of times when basic human freedoms and rights were being violated. So, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's formula. It's uh, it's ambivalent uh, formula. Of course, when we are talking about sovereignty, we can't um, forget about the president of the republic, uh, who shall ensure observance of the constitution, safeguard the sovereignty and security of the state, as well as the inviolability and integrity of its territory. Um, it's um, next. Um, um, it's it's um, uh, it's it's first value uh, in our preamble. Next, we've got some natural law and determinants of the constitution of the Republic of Poland. The legislator uh, refers to four universal values: truth, justice, goodness, and beauty. Uh, both those who believe in God as the source of truth, justice, good and beauty, as well as well as those not sharing such faith. So, uh, of course, it's a little bit ambivalent because uh, we've got Christian roots in the next paragraph that we are recalling the Christian roots, but um, we have universal formula. Both those who believe in God as the source of truth, justice, good and beauty, as well as those not sharing such faith. Three of them belong to the canon of basic perfections in Plato's uh, philosophy. They are objectives pursued by three parts of the soul, symbolized by three parts of the state. Yeah, the sapient, uh, so mm, volitional and lustful parts correspond to the ruled, uh, the defenders and the producers. In turn, these uh, three mm, uh, traits, the, these three features, uh, Aristotle links uh, truth, goodness and beauty to the three areas of cognition, theoretical, practical and poetic, autopoietic. Medieval philosophy, mm, these features, barum, bonum, pulchrum, yeah, so, so from Latin, uh, they were called uh, transcendentals. Subsequent tradition assigned these values to specific forms of spiritual culture, science. Science strives for, for truth, morality strives for goodness, and art strives for beauty. So we've got some determinants which are uh, supranatural, supranatural. Of course, dignity is really important, but um, I, I don't want to um, take only one slide for dignity. It's it's some uh, general, uh, general speaking, it's um, uh, it deserves uh, some more um, some more words. Justice for uh, justice. So uh, the next uh, feature. Uh, 
Mm, in the course of the work on constitution, because the, the canon three classic values, um, godness, beauty, um, and um, of course, uh, godness, beauty, and um, um, godness, beauty, and uh, of course, truth, uh, and the fourth uh, values, justice, which uh, was added after that as a principle of social life. Uh, the legislator consciously and intentionally added justice to this catalog. Um, of course, in antique tradition, it is uh, connected with a uh, bravery virtue uh, from Greek uh, arete. Yeah, pa it's it's kind of perfection of man. Uh, on one uh, Roman jurist Ulpian maintained that justice is a constant and unchangeable will to give everyone their due. Uh, one can find justice in the fa famous golden rule, evangelic golden rule. What you do, do not want done to yourself, do not uh, do to another. Uh, in positive form, it uh, can be found in the evangelical message. Do to others whatever you would have them to do, uh, you would have them do to you. Justice without uh, the law would only be possible if judges were sorcerers and people were saints. Of course, it's metaphorically speaking, but it's it's really apt uh, idea, of course, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, and John Rawls, um, I, I have to I have to recall John Rawls' words uh, because um, it's it was uh, definition of justice really famous and and really uh, apt, uh, really correct. As truth in knowledge systems, justice is the first virtue of social institutions. And in true theory, even if highly economical and elegant, has to be rejected or revised. The same is true for laws and uh, for laws and social institutions. However, efficient and well organized, they have to be re reformed or abolished if they are unjust. Yeah? So it's fundamental, absolutely fundamental value. Um, common good and common will. The most important, in my opinion, the most important aspect, um, common good um, tradition, because classical philosophy, um, it's it's um, it's from classical philosophy that we we are trying to find um, some uh, common good from Plato, Aristotle to Thomas Aquinas, and nowadays um, this inheritance um, is is uh, is continued um, by Catholic social science. But common will, it's it's solidarist formula, it's uh, communitarianism. Union of individuals established to take care of the good of such individuals, but as a whole that in itself constitutes the good and therefore has an independent non-individual value. Uh, so uh, in April Constitution from 1935, it's interwar period, uh, the Polish state is the commonwealth of all its citizens. So the, um, this, uh, the legislature accentuated this formula of common will. It means uh, that um, uh, it, it, it's it's a rejection of natural human rights as a relevant feature of, of constitutional order. This uh, solidarist formula was a move away from the concept of nation as a subject of the uh, of, of the supreme authority, uh, treating the state as a as as union of uh, individuals established to take care of the good. Yeah. Uh, such indi individuals. Um, so, April Constitution uh, from 1935 um, has had completely different tradition. Uh, current Constitution uh, in the um, second article um, stated um, status the Republic of Poland shall be the common good or good of its citizens. So. Common good. It's approached. Uh, it's approach perspective proposed in the post conciliar documents, Gaudium et Spes, and in the encyclical by, by John Twenty um, Third uh, uh, Pacem Interis defines the common good as the sum of both conditions of social life, thanks to which individuals, families, and associations can attain their own perfection more comprehensively and in easier way. In particular, this involves the respect for natural human rights and obligations. So um, it is um, really important to differentiate these two, um, these two um, uh, words, common good and common will. Uh, in Polish language, it's really, um, it's really interesting that um, um, 
uh, that it's the differentiation between common good and common will. It's only inversion on grammar rules. So, so we can specify that placing an adjective, adjective after a noun signals the presence of uh, of idiomatic ex expression. So, uh, so therefore, it is it is difficult to decode this uh, this uh, difference. Um, Additionally, one has to consider the legislators will noted at, at, at meetings of the constitutional committees. So, so we can decode not only from reading this um, paragraphs, from reading these articles, but the discussion, especially during uh, during the process of adoption, our uh, con our current constitution. Um, uh, so, of course, um, the category of the common good is based on the condition of Catholic social science. And next, um, uh, next um, subject, uh, which was moved during our conference, during our webinar, Invocatio Day in European Constitution. So, uh, in, abbrevi in abbreviation, some comparison, uh, some reflections. Island in the most holy trinity, Greece in the name of the holy trinity and consubstantial and invisible trinity, yeah, the professor. Uh, from uh, Zagreb uh, said about this uh, and Hungary, God bless the Hungarians, the national confession of faith. So perfect solution, in my opinion. Uh, Poland, both who believe in God as the source of truth, justice, good and beauty. So um, um, as well as those not sharing such faith, beholden to our ancestors for the for the labors, they struggle for independence, achieved a great sacrifice for our culture rooted in Christian heritage of nation and universal human values. So we've got substantive invocati invocatio day. It's not direct in direct meaning. It's not in invocatio day. It's formula. It's um, uh, it's broadened formula. It's broadened um, uh, in preamble. But of course, it's not um, it's not the name of God in this in this uh, in this, um, in this context and um, and Slovakia uh, and some uh, interesting point of view, Cyrillic Methodian spiritual heritage. So we've got Christian heritage in Polish constitution, for example, Slovakia, Cyrillic, Cyrillic Methodian spiritual heritage from the um, ninth century and to um, to excellent um, to excellent um, saints. Uh, so, uh, conclusions, of course. Conclusions. Um, generally speaking, the Polish constitution contains many values. I present, I have presented um, sovereignty, justice, um, and common good. In my opinion, common good is the most important because we have, we are recalling the um, common good tradition from Catholic social science. Uh, dignity and um, uh, dignity uh, too, but in par paragraph uh, 30. So we have. To, um, I, I need more time to explain to to you to all um, participants uh, how important is dignity. Of course, uh, many speakers uh, were told uh, about uh, were said uh, this subject. So so therefore, I, I don't want to concentrate ab about dignity because it's it's really separate uh, separate matter. Um, introduction to Polish constitution seems to be highly flawed. Uh, in my opinion, it's terminological weakness of this because uh, Polish basic law contains some axiological compromise. Of course, uh, I'm looking into the matter from the current perspective. It's easier to say uh, in 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 2022 uh, speaking about this because it's an uh, example of its indirect referral to God. Yeah, both those who believe in God as the source of truth, justice, good and beauty, as well as those not sharing such faith. So so it's kind of um, um, an axiological ambivalence. And uh, of course, in Polish constitution, one can find a classic invocatio day. Maybe it's um, uh, maybe it's a um, good um, recommendation to to change it uh, in the nearest future. Um, mindful of the bitter experiences of the times when the fundamental freedoms and human rights were violated violated in our homeland. So. Uh, of course, um, uh, my reflections um, above uh, are of uh, preparatory and indicative nature. The in-depth axiological reflection that this uh, 
the presentation strives to to encourage should be should precede any potential amendment of constitutional regulations uh, action milestones uh, can be identified in this manner where are we now with, with whole with whole complications and where we where are we heading subsequently the clearly presented word of values will enable the sovereign to to verify the actions taken by politicians and the law practitioners who unfortunately frequently use complicated and multi-level uh, regulations to relativize uh, rather than build the word of values uh, the world of universal values yeah so so it's it's sad but but it's true of course uh, thank you for your attention and i hope so that we could a little uh, i hope so that we could discuss this subject uh, fruitfully <laughs> thank you very much dr kostatsky thank you so much uh, for your uh, precious uh, contribution uh, and now i uh, would like to share the screen uh, with uh, uh, Professor Woman from Arizona State University, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. It's worth noticing that approximately one year ago we have a meeting uh, here in Hungary during his uh, visit at the Matthias Korins Coll uh, Collegium. Um, he delivered uh, a nice presentation uh, for us, for my colleague, uh, here in Ferenc Madel uh, Institute, and at that time, uh, I was absolutely certain uh, that his thoughts can be uh, interesting not only for my colleagues but for others. Therefore, I uh, had invited him uh, into our journal to publish an article, uh, and uh, uh, now I would like to ask here him, sorry, uh, to uh, deliver uh, his uh, uh, presentation. Thank Professor, you. The screen is yours. Thank you. And I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that, so I don't think I need uh, screen sharing if you can uh, get rid of that. And uh, I think the last speaker is also still un unmuted, so I'm getting a little feedback in my computer if um... is OK. OK, OK, so you're all OK. Great. So my claim to be here, I guess, is that I visited Hungary, a really wonderful visit about eight months ago, and then my father is Polish. So I guess that counts for something. Uh, but other than that, um, I uh, write about fundamental rights uh, adjudication and jurisprudence in the United States. And so my paper uh, for uh, this volume of the Comparative Law Journal is about subsidiarity and fundamental rights jurisprudence in the United States and what kind of model America might be for Europe or perhaps should not be uh, for Europe. So my paper describes the evolution of fundamental rights adjudication uh, in the United States and it challenges the provenance, the origin of the current doctrine. So some background, historically, the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution did not apply against the state governments. It only applied against the federal government. The states had their own constitutions and their own bills of rights. They still do today, but they're far less important uh, because gradually in the 20th century, under the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which was enacted after the Civil War, the Supreme Court began incorporating or applying the Federal Bill of Rights against the states of the Union. This is what's called incorporation, incorporating the Bill of Rights against the states. So today, almost all of the rights in the Bill of Rights to the US Constitution apply against the states as well. And this means that the Supreme Court's interpretations of those rights also apply, including the Supreme Court's bad interpretations. Right. So, for example, uh, the, I use this example because it's one of the most obviously wrong uh, Bill of Rights uh, decisions. The Supreme Court, our U.S. Supreme Court, uh, has held that under the Fourth Amendment's unreasonable search and seizure uh, 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 prohibition, uh, that physical evidence obtained during an unlawful police search must be excluded from trials. OK, this has nothing to do with the original meaning of this search and seizure amendment. OK, 
and it means that lots of uh, criminal uh, uh, guilty criminal defendants end up going free uh, because reliable physical evidence is excluded because the police didn't get a proper warrant or something like that. And just to be clear, historically, there were other remedies uh, against unlawful searches uh, in tort. So you can sue a police officer for exceeding their authority. You can get damages and, and things like that. But you, but exclusion of reliable physical evidence was never a thing. Well, when the Supreme Court ruled this, it then applied this exclusionary rule to all of the states. So all 50 states are bound by this erroneous interpretation of the Constitution. Now, incorporation used to be controversial largely uh, for this reason. Conservatives objected because they believed that an activist Supreme Court in the 1960s and 1970s incorrectly interpreted numerous rights in the Bill of Rights and then applied those erroneous interpretations in all 50 states. But over time, even conservatives accepted incorporation, and they do today. Today, so-called originalists, those who maintain that we should interpret the Constitution with its original meaning, almost universally believe that incorporation is correct under a different clause of the 14th Amendment, than, but, but nevertheless correct. Incorporation is only occasionally still controversial. So it was last controversial in 2010, 2010, when the Supreme Court incorporated the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms right? The right to bear arms. For the first time, it was the progressives. It was the liberals who objected to incorporation. But of course, they only objected because it was a particular right, guns, right, that they happened not to, to like very much. So it was not very principled uh, of them. Well, so as I said, today, incorporation is basically gospel, okay, among uh, scholars and judges in the United States. But I think incorporation is probably still wrong, under the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. And I'd like to use my remaining time to explain why I think that's the case. So the clause of the 14th Amendment that supposedly incorporates the Bill of Rights against the states is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. It provides no state shall make or enforce any law, okay? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, it certainly sounds like this is a good vehicle for incorporation, right? What are the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States? Well, surely those in the Bill of Rights. Right? I mean, it sounds it sounds plausible. But I want to argue that this clause doesn't incorporate the Bill of Rights at all. The clause is instead or was instead intended to be when it was written and adopted in 1868, an equality guarantee with respect to civil rights under state law. What this means, if I'm correct, is that the states can still regulate and define the content of their civil rights. They can still regulate civil rights for the common good, for the public good. But what they can't do is discriminate in the provision of those rights. I think this means, for example, if I'm right, that California could prohibit handguns, okay? What California can't say is only white people are allowed to have handguns. That you can't do. That's a discrimination in the provision of the right. But otherwise, the states can still experiment and regulate and define the content uh, of civil rights. OK, why am I right? Why am I correct about this? Well, because it's widely accepted that the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to constitutionalize, supply a constitutional basis for the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Okay. So a key to uncovering the meaning of the 14th Amendment is to figure out what does the Civil Rights Act of 1866 do? Well, after slavery was abolished in the United States, the southern state governments systematically discriminated in the civil rights uh, against black persons, the newly freed people, uh, the newly freed men and women in the South. So the newly freed black population in the South in these in what were called black codes were not allowed to assemble together. They weren't allowed to own real property. They weren't allowed to own guns, firearms, all restrictions. And there were other civil rights restrictions not applicable to white persons, only applicable to black persons. So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 declared as follows. And I'll read here. All persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States and such citizens of every race and color shall be entitled to this, shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties to give evidence, to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, convey, hold real and personal property as is enjoyed by white citizens. 
Okay. Note what the Civil Rights Act does and doesn't do. It doesn't define any civil rights. It doesn't guarantee any of the civil rights. The states can still regulate contract, property, gun rights for the common good. OK, they can still make regulations of civil rights for the common good. What the states can't do is discriminate. That was the point. Whatever rights were given to a white person, a white citizen, had to also be given to a black citizen and other citizens free of arbitrary discrimination. OK, a couple more points here. Note the terminology. Right again, remember I said privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States sounds like the Federal Bill of Rights, the constitutional rights in the federal constitution, right? But note how it's used in the, the, the terminology of the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act declares persons born in the United States to be citizens of the United States and then says such citizens of the United States as a privilege of national citizenship are entitled to equality in civil rights under state law. OK, that's what it does. Now, the problem was, of course, Congress, the national government, didn't have power to enact the civil rights law, right? This is in America, constitutional law 101, the basic division of federal and state power. The federal government is a government of enumerated powers, limited powers. Where does the federal government get the right to interfere with contract, property, tort, criminal law, you know, in the states? It didn't. It needed a new power. OK, and that's why we get the 14th Amendment. Several members of Congress in 1866 and 67 specifically said we need a new amendment to supply a constitutional basis for the Civil Rights Act. OK, so what clause in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment gives us the Civil Rights Act? Well, the Privileges or Immunities Clause. It's parallel to the Civil Rights Act. Right. The Civil Rights Act began with a declaration of U.S. citizenship and then says as such U.S. citizens, we get equality in civil rights under state law. The 14th Amendment begins the same way. All persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States okay, and of the state where they reside. And then it says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So I think it's the privileges or immunities clause that constitutionalizes the Civil Rights Act. Now. One last point about this, right? A lot of people think that we, we have a clause in the 14th Amendment called the Equal Protection Clause. You may have heard of it, that there's this equal protection guarantee in the United States Constitution. And a lot of people think, well, equal protection is what requires equal rights. And if that's true, then my reading is redundant. It's unnecessary. It's superfluous because the Equal Protection Clause is what guarantees equality. Well, the Equal Protection Clause does not guarantee equal rights. The Equal Protection Clause guarantees the equal protection of the laws. What was the protection of law? The protection of law in Anglo-American legal history was a legal concept uh, by which the government had to give you legal protection against private people, private parties that sought to interfere with your enjoyment and exercise of your rights. So the protection of the law was quintessentially judicial remedies. You needed the ability to sue in court if your neighbor commits a trespass against you or commits a tort against you. OK, protection from private violence was what protection of law was. So mob rule, rule by mobs, was the quintessential violation of protection of the law. So the protection of the laws clause doesn't guarantee equal civil rights. It merely guarantees protection for whatever civil rights you already have under the law. Therefore, I must be correct about the privileges or immunities clause being this equality guarantee. And if it's this equality guarantee, OK, then that means we don't get incorporation. This means that it remains within the power, at least if we want to be originalists, which most conservatives in America want to be, right? It means it is with still within the power of the states today to define and regulate civil rights from contract to property to guns to free speech, OK? as long as they don't discriminate. So I want to be clear about this, right? And I'm almost done, I promise. It was presumed in the 19th century, right, that all free governments protected and secured certain natural rights. That's why governments were established. This was, this was a presumption, OK? But must all free governments have the same answer to the question of whether flag burning should be prohibited? 
what, what speech rights students have in schools, whether it's lawful to protest at a dead soldier's funeral, whether the state should be allowed to prohibit the advertising of violent video games to minors, okay? whether you can prohibit the stealing of valor, like pretending to be a Medal of Honor recipient, say all things that the United States Supreme Court has made rulings on as a matter of the federal First Amendment and applied those rulings to all 50 states. Okay, Under my reading, which I humbly submit to you all as the correct historical reading, okay, the states can decide such questions for themselves so long as they do not discriminate. Okay, that's, that's the key. So in conclusion, I guess my overarching claim today is that if U.S. fundamental rights jurisprudence is going to be looked to as a model for European in European fundamental rights debates respecting the division of authority between the European Union and the individual member states when it comes to common values, fundamental values, fundamental rights protections, that you United States jurisprudence should at least be assessed in light of its historical context, okay? By which I mean, it should be remembered that the US approach was probably not a product of lawmaking by the people. It was probably an act of lawmaking by judges, likely exceeding their authority under the Constitution. And that's and that's really all I wanted to say today. Professor, thank you so much uh, for this uh, uh, presentation. Um, of course, uh, now that is the uh, opportunity uh, for the uh, discussions. Um, I would like to repeat myself that is uh, the uh, not the presentations but the articles written by the presenters they are they were published uh, or they are published uh, today uh, into the journal of the Central European Journal of Comparative Law, the journal of the Franz Madel Institute uh, that, therefore you can enjoy uh, uh, the uh, uh, longer thoughts of the presenters in the journal. Um, but now you can ask them or you can ask each other, of course. I think you don't have to raise your hand. You can probably just uh, unmute uh, yourself. I, I can talk, just yes, talk. Yes, of course. The floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for my voice. I, I have some uh, some general uh, reflections. Um, listening this uh, conference, listening this webinar, uh, some, uh, when we are talking about Christian values, um, uh, we have to uh, remember that this uh, clash of uh, um, civiliz civilizations clash, clash is, is kind of um, uh, some, so uh, we have some, so many levels, yes, of, of this civil civilizational clash. Uh, so, so, for example, mediating social, uh, political, um, and and the rhetoric is uh, the, the rhetoric enjoyed by conservatives who who refer to the foundations of European culture. Uh, we we should remember that we've got some three big pillars. It's it's kind of our buffer uh, in, in this context. So it's uh, of course it's Greek uh, philosophy, uh, it's Roman law, and and. Um, uh, Christianity. These uh, three pillars um, uh, were um, uh, these three pillars are really important to uh, to every debate about Christian values because without uh, these three pillars we cannot uh, imagine contemporary Europe. Uh, but but I would like to ask um, Mr. Wurman. Uh, uh, she spoke about the originalist, originalist and legislator. Um, will legislator historical uh, legislator will uh, do you think that in European uh, conditions we can change we can uh, in every case in many cases um, adjust to this um, uh, original will uh, maybe in some um, I have impression I have it's my it's my opinion I have impression that uh, however uh, the dynamic interpretation uh, can give many um, benefits for conservatives too. So uh, it depends on many cases and a multi-level, um, multi-level conflicts and and contradictions, which are uh, really difficult to uh, to uh, analyze uh, to find a right uh, solution. Thank you very yep. much. Thank you for uh, for the question. And uh, so I'm sure you're you're all fall or. 
it is you are more likely than most people to be following this debate that is going on in the United States right now. We uh, as conservatives traditionally believed in this thing called originalism, the idea that we should be bound by the original meaning of the Constitution. And according to that, you know, original meaning, right, there are some things in the Constitution that conservatives like, say the Second Amendment, there are some things that progressives like, uh, direct income tax, 17th, yeah, 16th Amendment, you know, other things like that. And then, you know, a lot of questions the Constitution just doesn't answer. It leaves them to the democratic process where progressives or libertarians or conservatives can win. But now that conservatives appear to be entrenched in the judiciary uh, and on the Supreme Court, all of a sudden some conservatives have changed their tune, like Adrian Vermeule at Harvard, who just published a book called Common Good Constitutionalism, arguing that judges should interpret, you know, I don't even know if I want to call it interpreting law, because if it's not compelled by the original meaning of the Constitution, what are you interpreting, right? I think his view is that judges should impose their vision of the common good through judicial decision making. And I think the Constitution of the United States aims toward the common good, but it creates the conditions in which the common good can be pursued through the democratic process where uh, these debates over the common good should be fought out, right? Where there are these differences of opinion. But it, 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 exactly for what the reason that you said, I often ask liberals who like this dynamic interpretation, living constitution, right? I ask them, do you want a conservative living constitutionalist rather than an originalist, right? And then they're like, uh, you know, well, it turns out, you know, they love living constitutionalism when they're in charge. And then after they're not in charge, things get, a bit hairier, right? Well, I still very much believe that that the common good should be pursued and can be constitutionally pursued through the demo democratic process in the several states of the union. That's my view. So it's about subsidiarity, the local local government decision making, and I think we're more likely to actually obtain the common good when we have local control, you know, in the states, in the in the cities, in the counties over things like education that are so crucial uh, for the common good. The most famous uh, originalist was Antonio Scalia, yeah? He, he, he was the yes. most famous. Uh, and, and I'm the second most famous. At least try, <laughs> try In to. the near future, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when, when I am looking into the um, law as a phenomenon, um, I, I try to find five dimensions because we were speaking about lawmaking, yeah? But, um, creation lawmaking creation it's it's really vital it's really crucial but of course we've got validity uh, creation validity interpretation uh, and uh, and uh, compliance yes so, so uh, as a, a philosopher of law it's important to see law in whole dimensions because uh, sometimes i had i had i have an impression that um, Mm, that scientists um, see only one dimension in law as uh, paradigm, as as their own paradigm, uh, which is really uh, widened. Yes, so 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 it's uh, it, it's general statement. Thank you very much for a response. Also, one one other point to your initial question. I think originalism makes much more sense in Europe because. Why is it so controversial in the United States? Because our constitution is so old, older even than the Polish constitution. Yeah. As you yes, I said right? <laughs> this. And, okay. and, uh, and it's hard to amend. And it's hard to amend. It's very hard so, to amend. So uh, you are waiting for constitutional moment as in Poland, for example. It's, it's, a, it's called in doctrine, constitutional moment. The <laughs> moment in which society and politi political fractions are ready to change the basic law. Exactly, and it's much harder to have those moments in the United States, at least under the existing framework of the Constitution yeah. and its amendment provision, than in, say, Hungary, which amended its Constitution 10 years ago, right? Uh, and by the way, the Hungarian Constitution, I think, has a clause in it that says it should be interpreted as a li living tree or living, what was, am I getting this right? Am I recalling approximately what this is? Which I find quite interesting, actually, if yeah. someone can speak to that. <laughs> I hope that Living Professor. Covenant. 
Professor Shanda? Um, well, uh, the wording that the preamble has is a living covenant uh, between generations. Um, I wonder how much uh, I've received a question on the chat board. Uh, I wonder if I may I give an, uh, try to give an answer or yeah, yeah. It, it, you I have an opportunity, of course. For it. Uh, it, I certainly needed at least an hour to explain uh, to explain the uh, the framework as I understand it. It's my personal uh, personal view on it. Um, our first uh, general view on uh, uh, I don't know if Colleague Luning is here, but I assume he still is. Uh, uh, our first general law on religious freedom uh, was back in uh, 1895. Uh, that has established a two tier system uh, differentiating between incorporated religious communities and accepted ones. Incorporated ones uh, were decided by parliament, and a second class recognition was decided by a government agency. Uh, this has remained uh, in this way for a, a couple of decades. Uh, in 1949, it has been changed in a, in a way that the upper tier of the two-tier system has been abolished. And all the all, uh, uh, recognized uh, religious communities be, uh, received equal rights, but on the lower tier, uh, and were put under, under uh, state control. And uh, religious freedom, Corporative religious freedom has not been acknowledged uh, for uh, communities that were not recognized by the state. A gradual change has come uh, at the change of regime, at the collapse of communism, uh, 1990. Uh, since 1990, you don't need a legal status, any kind of legal status to enjoy religious freedom. And religious freedom shall be equal for all, for all individuals and all communities, irrespective of their legal status. Uh, the 1990 le legislation has put all religious communities in the same legal framework, uh, providing them a very easily accessible legal status that has been called church. In a, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a theological concept. It's a, it has only been a, a legal a, 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 a box, a title uh, uh, given by the, by the law. Religious communities were all referred by the law as churches. And uh, the recognition of procedure was exchanged to a, uh, to a registration procedure, formal registration. Uh, hundreds of communities uh, received this registration. And this system has been uh, uh, changed, uh, uh, revised in 2011, as you refer to it, uh, reintroducing a two-tier system, uh, a two-tier system we already had 100 years ago. Uh, providing for uh, the differences between the, the old two-tier system and the new one is that uh, you don't need uh, any kind of uh, registration or recognition for the free exercise of religion. Uh, the upper tier is decided on by parliament, and we have over 30 communities recognized by parliament in the upper tier. And the lower tier, a base level legal entity status, is very open and can be easily uh, can be easily uh, uh, is easily accessible. Uh, following a Strasbourg Court decision um, and a constitutional court decision in the country, Parliament in 2018 has uh, refined the system, uh, also amending the fundamental law. In fact, uh, providing for uh, four different tiers. Uh, recognized churches by parliament, uh, religious association as a base level entity, and in between a class one and class two uh, recognition for religious communities. Um, it's uh, not, uh, it, 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 these are possibilities uh, 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 of different uh, kinds of uh, legal statuses for religious communities. Uh, no religious community has to uh, get registered or recognized if they don't want to. It's not a question of freedom, it's a question of uh, cooperation. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it's not just a, f a few communities that have lost their status. They have enjoyed 
by the, under the 1990 uh, legal system or 1990 statute that all of them, in, well, all the mainstream religious community, everyone has lost it uh, because the, the, the category has been abolished. And instead of the old category, we have now four different categories, four different tiers of statuses. Uh, in uh, fact, uh, I, in, in my understanding, the system is still uh, probably much more liberal than in many European countries like Germany or Belgium or uh, a number of other countries uh, that have a, a two-tier system or a multi-tier system. Uh, having more than 30 religious communities in the upper tier, uh, including a number of Buddhist communities, uh, Muslim communities, etc., uh, communities that are do, do not enjoy uh, a privileged legal status uh, in many countries like Jehovah's Witnesses and the list can be list is accessible uh, and it's really, really an extensive list. Uh, but it's uh, by nature, it's much easier to uh, uh, to liberalize a rigid system than to channel a, a, an over liberal system. Uh, it's uh, uh, is, is somehow uh, the legislator, in my understanding, has tried the latter one. Uh, which is a difficult, uh, which is a difficult task, uh, but uh, it's not about uh, uh, free exercise of religion. Uh, even uh, a religious association enjoys public support, uh, full tax exemption, etc. Uh, but uh, the higher tier, uh, let us say the the, the privileged re uh, religious communities, uh, they. Uh, they are uh, expected to cooperate uh, with the state, uh, and uh, cooperation needs two parties. Um, and uh, yes, there is some discretion of parliament uh, with whom they engage into cooperation. And probably the, the point I was trying to make uh, is that. Uh, 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 cultural, uh, one of the elements, one of the components uh, we need for a cooperation is cultural relevance. Uh, it's not about uh, it's not about freedom, and it's not a question of discrimination. Uh, but uh, 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 a community uh, uh, that is uh, probably, uh, of course. Hungary uh, is less affected by uh, migration and, 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 and a, a set of phenomena uh, that have uh, changed and colored the religious landscape in, in many European countries. Uh, but uh, uh, probably the, the, the number of religious communities uh, shaping the cultural landscape, having a real impact on it, uh, is is uh, is limited, and uh, and uh, uh, not in the sense as let us say in well in England the, the Church of England has its special role, or in Denmark uh, the Lutheran Church has its special. It's not about one state church, uh, but uh, but the the the, the, the cultural relevance. Uh, Beyond uh, providing social services uh, in all fields, has its uh, has its relevance, and uh, and uh, uh, it's just uh, it just didn't correspond, I, in my understanding, uh, to reality uh, to put uh, all religious communities uh, uh, into the same legal category, as their social realities are so different. Uh, just uh, well, um, um, I, I don't know if that makes sense. I I don't see you on the board. Uh, uh, if uh, if uh, uh, if uh, you are interested in the topic, feel free con to contact me. I'm I'm more than happy to, to talk about issues of that kind. Professor, thank you so much for your answer. And now uh, the screen is. Uh, of uh, David uh, Kostetsky, yeah, of course. Uh, 
uh, one more word to Professor uh, Tibor, uh, because um, um, uh, Mr. said that um, about the principle of autonomy, independence and cooperation uh, between uh, authorities, public authorities and churches. Yeah, so um, uh, in my paper um, um, I wrote uh, something about this, uh, this uh, subject, about this matter. Uh, and about the principle of autonomy, uh, independence and cooperation and the relations between uh, authorities, uh, public authorities and churches. It is um, from, from philosophy of law, from theory of law, it's important to say that impartiality is um, unachievable in, in some context, total Im impartiality is unachievable. Why? Because um, when the state declaring its impartiality rejects or even neglects uh, the existing uh, historically ingrained ethical values, ethical order, uh, creates a new value system. Yeah? So uh, we have to say that, that it's only a form of declaration, impartiality, it's a form of declaration. It's not a normativization. Why? Because uh, there can be no neutrality or, or impartiality when it comes to uh, cases of legalization of abortion, euthanasia, the adoption of children by homosexual couples, uh, the removal of crosses from public sphere uh, areas. Um, it's, it's not re religiously, uh, axiologically and philosophically neutral and therefore uh, compromises the religion that has been uh, the foundation of the culture of many nations for ages. So uh, just it's it's connected with Christian roots. Yeah. So so we are talking about some um, legal um, fiction, legal fiction um, in context of impartiality, of course, in my opinion, if you if you agree with this statement. Thank you very much for fruitful discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much. In this case, before the closing of this uh, event, uh, I would like to express my gratitude for uh, the authors and presenters uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. I would like to emphasize that you can find the email address of the presenters in the journal as well. Therefore, if you would like to accept uh, the proposal of uh, Professor uh, uh, Shanda, in this case, you can find uh, uh, his email address in the journal as well. Uh, their uh, presenters, uh, their professors, and their audience. Thank you so much for your attentions and have a nice day. Thank you very much. See you in the near future. I hope so. Bye bye. Bye.